Savior and my God. 
perfect spotless righteousness the great unchangeable i am the king of glory and of grace because the sinless savior died my sinful soul is counted free for god the just is satisfied to look on him and pardon me to look on him and pardon me because the sinless savior died my sinful soul is counted free for god the just is satisfied to look on him and pardon me to look on him and pardon me Good morning, everybody. 
So nice to see you all. My name's Amanda, if I haven't met you before, and I am so happy to be here with you um, to learn about our great God and also to praise him in song, which is what we're going to do to start. So please stand and let's start by singing Save My Soul.
Good morning, everybody. Please take a seat and welcome to Minchabri Anglican Church this morning. My name is Mike. I'm the senior minister here at the church. And if you're watching at home online, thank you so much for tuning in today as well. We gather together each Sunday to give expression to our mission as a church, and that is to make disciples and to multiply communities that love Jesus and to show Jesus love. And we gather to be equipped and inspired to continue that mission to our local community uh, and beyond. If you are visiting our church for the first time this morning, either here in person or watching at home online, can I encourage you to engage uh, with us? If you're here in the building, in the seats there in front of you, you can find a little blue card that says, Welcome. And on the back of that, you can share any details that you're comfortable sharing. Um, Particularly let us know if there's anything you need prayer for or if there is any practical help or support that you would like at this time. Our ministry team love to care for and to pray for our church community. So you can use uh, those cards. Um, If you're watching at home online, you can scan the QR code that's on your screen uh, and that'll take you to an online version of that same uh, card. Well, this Sunday, we are continuing our teaching series through the book of Ephesians. We're almost coming to the end. We're into Ephesians chapter 6, which is the last uh, chapter. We're going to look at the first part of chapter 6 today, and then we'll finish Ephesians chapter 6 and the entire letter uh, next week. Um, Last week, we we reflected on uh, marriage and how it may be time again for not just our wider world, but particularly for the church to reconsider what God has to say about those important relationships. And we continue a similar theme as we move into chapter six and and think about family life and think about our life in the wider community and society, uh, particularly in our workplace. And so there are so many different views and opinions and self-help books and self-help guides that you can read to have a flourishing family life and to Uh, a really good career or whatever it might mean. But again, so often those views and opinions leave us wanting more and we keep buying books and we keep watching shows and we keep listening to podcasts. It's time again, I think, to listen again to what God has to say about our family life, about our community life. And Chris Gray is going to be preaching to us later in our time together today. So I look forward to that. Today is also the last Sunday of the month, which means we're going to share together in the Lord's Supper as we remember in a real tangible way what Jesus has done for us, living, dying and rising again to forgive us and to offer us hope uh, for the future. Today is a good day to be at church. Let me pray and commit our morning to the Lord before our kids uh, head on out to Kids Church today. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, this is the day that you have made. We rejoice and are glad in it. Father, we thank you for this opportunity you have given us to gather together as your people here in the building and also for those that are watching at home online. We thank you for the opportunity to hear your word, to build each other up in love. And we pray that you will go before us now, that you will show us from your word what you want us to see and that you'll move in our hearts to to praise you and to live for you in all things this day. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Well, kids, why don't you stand on up and head on out those doors to your kids' church program. Have a wonderful morning and look at the rabble as they get up and leave. And and everybody else, as the kids head on out to their program, why don't you take a moment now just to greet those around you, catch up, and we'll move into our rest of our service in a, in a minute or two. So enjoy this time.
Okay, welcome back everybody. Let me encourage you to continue those conversations that you've begun over morning tea at the end of our service. It's a beautiful winter's morning, the sun is shining. It'll be a great opportunity to share, not just in uh, morning tea together, but in conversations, uh, particularly um, after hearing God's word, what an opportunity it is to reflect together and to chat about that uh, together. Uh, let me just share with you some news that's happening in the life of our church. Again, I say this each week, but don't forget to stay connected with us, not just here on a Sunday, uh, but during the week as well. Make sure you subscribe to all of our electronic uh, communication, our social media, so that you don't miss any uh, events and news that's happening in the life of the church. Now, a couple of things for your attention today. Uh, on Monday, the 4th of July, so not tomorrow, but the following Monday, I'm going to be holding just a very short half an hour, 40 minute uh, Zoom prayer evening. As we come to the end of another school term, God has been very good to us as a church, very kind. And whenever God is good and kind, and he always is, it's right for his people to thank him, to praise him, to pray to him. And uh, I know at wintertime, it can be challenging to come out at night. So I'm just holding a Zoom uh, prayer night. For anyone that would like to join me, you're welcome uh, next Monday night, 7.30 to 8 o'clock or just afterwards, to give thanks to God for the term, to praise him and to commit the next uh, term to him uh, in prayer. So I'll let that be, uh, put that in your calendars if you're able to. Now, we mentioned this last week, but coming up on the first day of term three for the kids and families in our community, it is a pupil free day. And as a means of serving our local community and showing uh, our, I guess, uh, desire to, to reach out to our local community, we're running this Kids Big Day in on Monday, the 18th of July, uh, 9 a.m. to 3 p.m., although there is a late pickup option at 5.30 for those in our community who would like that option. And we've themed the day Treasure Hunters. And as you, if you've been watching the church news on a Friday, you know that I've been encouraging our kids and our families to get ready to buy your pirate costume and to practice your pirate speak because we're going to have a great time. There'll be lots of activities, lots of fun, lots of food, and a great time of learning in God's word about the greatest treasure in the whole wide world, which of course, as Colin Buchanan tells us, is peace with God. So I look forward to that Monday, the 18th of July. If you have any questions about that, uh, talk to Matt Shannon. Uh, you can register uh, online as well. Last night, we had a great men's event. Uh, so thank you to the team that organized that for us. And ladies, fear not if you feel like you're being left behind. You're not. Next month at the end of July, July the 30th on a Saturday afternoon, uh, you get your turn, an event called The Private Woman. We had The Private Man last night. And then uh, ladies, you're going to be thinking about from God's word about The Private Woman, uh, you know, all the different relationships that make up uh, your life, uh, particularly those that are closest to you and what God's word has to say uh, to you. The men were greatly encouraged. Wives, ask your husbands how it was and what they learned. Uh, and then there can be some reciprocation uh, at the end of uh, July. So if you need any information about that, you can talk to Emily Gray um, or to uh, my wife, Ness, uh, if you need any further questions about that. Now, coming up also in July, Mark Bullen and I are going to be running a brand new ministry uh, here at Minchinbury Anglican Church called uh, Divorce Care. It's a, a support group for those who are facing separation and divorce, either presently or have in the past, and there are still some trauma that's there. And we want to provide a safe place. It's a support group, a pastoral care group, uh, where you can be encouraged by sharing your experience uh, with others, where we can uh, hear from God's word and from renowned counsellors and psychologists about how to process the significant hurt, pain and trauma that's often associated with uh, separation and divorce. Um, it's a, a reasonably long program. It'll go for 12 to 13 uh, weeks. And so it's going to be starting on Monday night, the 18th of July, uh, 7.30 uh, here in the church. We're going to run it for four weeks, have a break for two weeks, run it for another four weeks, have a break for the school holidays, and then finish it off uh, in term four. Now, I've got a video to show you to give you a tit-off uh, in term four. Now, I've got a video to show you to give you a taste of what you can expect uh, at Divorce Care. So, enjoy. You can talk about divorce, separation, with your friends and your family, but until they've gone through it, they don't get it. I don't know who I am anymore, and I don't know what that next step looks like. I was so angry, so bitter. I was like, why me, God? You know? 
feel like I did all the right things. Why me? A divorce can be a traumatic and isolating experience, but there is hope. Divorce Care is a video-based support group that helps you heal from the pain of separation or divorce. When I was listening to the Divorce Care video and then the participants, I was like, oh my gosh, we all speak the same language. You are there with a group of people who are going through the same thing, and it really touches you. It's a great resource for anyone who's going through a separation or a divorce. It really helped me to stay grounded. There's others with you that are carrying you to get through the uh, hardships that everybody experiences in a divorce. Finding a place that you know that you can surround yourself with great people can help you walk through that. It, it is imperative. Each Divorce Care video session, plus weekly small group discussion and encouraging workbook exercises, guide you to health, hope, and healing. It actually is 100% effective on changing your life. There are lots of testimonies of how a group like Divorce Care has helped uh, many, many uh, people. And so if you're someone that has gone through a separation or divorce or are involved in that at the moment and you think this group would be good for you, then can I commend it to you? You're very welcome uh, to join us. If you know somebody that's going through this experience and you think, hey, a group like this would be great for them, you are welcome to invite them. Uh, we want to try and keep the numbers of the group to a manageable level. And so if you would like to come, then can I encourage you to send an email to the church office, info at minchinbury.church, and let us know uh, if you would like to join. Uh, that way we can see how, what the interest is like and uh, how manageable the group uh, might, might be. So info at minchinbury.church. Uh, well, friends, now we're going to transition into a time of prayer, and I'm going to invite one of our congregation members, Steve Longley, to lead us this morning. Well, good morning. Um, my name is Steve, and uh, I'll be leading us through some prayers for the uh, prayers for the world, uh, for Australian community and our local community, and our church here at um, at Minchinbury. So, please, uh, well, just before we do that, in in Psalms uh, chapter seventeen, verse six, it's really important to read. I call on you, my God, for you will answer me. Turn your ear to me and hear my prayer. Let's talk to our Father in heaven. Heavenly Father, God of mercy and of peace, we hold before you the people of, Af of Afghanistan. Be living bread to those who are hungry each day. Be healing and wholeness to those who have no access to health care amidst the ravages of the earthquake this week. Be their true home to all who have been displaced. Be open arms of, of loving acceptance to those who fear because of their gender or ethnicity or, or religious or political views. Father, please guide the wealthy governments of the world to put aside their differences and send more aid to the people of Afghanistan. Be peace to those engaged in armed conflict and those who live within its shadow. Turn our hearts and minds to, the, to your ways of just and gentle peace. Open our eyes to, to see you in all acts of compassion and care and strengthen our hearts to step out in solidarity with your, with your suffering people and hold us in all your unfailing love. Heavenly Father, hear our prayers for our brothers and sisters in Ukraine. Lord, we ask for, for peace for those who, who need peace, reconciliation for those who need reconciliation and comfort for all those who, who don't know what tomorrow may bring. Lord, may your kingdom come and your will be done. Lord God, we ask for, for you to be with all, especially the children who are suffering as the crisis in Ukraine uh, deteriorates. Lord, for, for those who are anxious and fearful, for those who are, are bereaved, injured, or, or who have lost their, their lives of, of loved ones, and for those who have lost their own lives, Father, please hear our prayers. In Thessalonians 2, uh, chapter 3, verse 16, may the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times in every way. The Lord will be with all of you. 
Lord, we ask that decision makers hear your voice. Parents protecting their families, deciding whether to stay or leave. Church leaders as they support and comfort people. And Lord, we ask for wise actions from global leaders who have the power not only to start wars, but to stop them as, as well. And Father God, we cry out for an end to the crisis, for mercy, peace and truth, because you are the light, hope, power and love. Father, you have called us to live for you and exhort one another to love and good deeds. In many regions and countries around the world right now, Christians are not permitted to meet. We pray that you may find a way, give them safety and veil the eyes of those who, who seek to prevent such gatherings. We thank you that even we, when we cannot meet, our unity and, and connection in Jesus is, is, is a greater communion and than any physical gathering. Thank you for the unity we have in Christ. Holy and loving God, the psalmist reminds us that you are our refuge and strength an ever-present help in trouble. Eternal God, we recognize a sense of fear and anxiety about the future. We ask that we calmly place our faith in you and increase our love for our neighbor. We believe you care deeply about those who are affected by the speedy spread of influenza and the ongoing pandemic. In these troubling times, teach us how to be agents of peace and carriers of compassion. We pray for all those who are on the front line of this, this battle uh, in our healthcare, our medical teams, our health professionals and their patients. Grant, we pray, safety and healing for all. We pray for our political leaders, national and state, that you, you would give them wisdom and insight. We pray for all those who have lost loved ones to this virus. Grant them comfort and, and courage. We pray for all those who have lost their jobs or businesses, grant them the, the help they need. We pray for all Australians that you would give us, you would help with us to replace fear with faith and despair with hope and hoarding with kindness. Please bring out the best in us as we face the challenge of these days. Heavenly Father, we lift to you this church. We thank you for the many blessings you have provided. We thank you for the leadership team of Mike and Chris, Matt and Elizabeth. And we particularly thank you for their teachings, their talents and gifts. And we especially thank you for all the support of their families. We give thanks for Mel Gill and Sandra King and all the wonderful, committed, godly people, missionaries and, and others that are engaging with our community every day to further your kingdom. We, we thank you for the, the men's gathering last night and we pray that you will guide the men of this world to love their wives as Christ loved the church. We give thanks for the wardens, the parish council and all the volunteers who contribute to the running of, of the church. We pray that all decisions for the church will be made prayerfully and all those who have chosen to lead, you have chosen to lead, will do so in a godly way. Father, we ask for your healing hand upon those who are sick, anxious, unemployed, or finding life challenging at the moment. We pray that you would commit their afflictions to, to you and that you answer their prayers and provide them peace and comfort. We particularly pray for Ruel and, Ruel and Lucy, who have just recently announced their engagement, Nick, Nick Shelley and Ted Spencer for their, their ongoing health, and we pray for health improvement. Father, we, we uh, just ask you to watch over... Um, Miela Tulfa and her ongoing uh, cancer treatment and Anika, Anita Luke uh, for her health situation as well. Father, we pray that you would guide us and help us to be a welcoming and encouraging and generous church, avoiding the temptations and, and sinful ways of the world. A church that connects and engages well with both the local community and our mission areas around the world. And Father, we present our prayers and requests in Jesus' name to you. Amen. I have the privilege of reading the Bible for us this morning. We're going to be reading from Ephesians chapter 6, starting at verse 1. And in the Bibles in the pews, that's on page 1079.
Ephesians chapter 6, starting at verse 1. Children, obey your parents as you would the Lord, because this is right. Honour your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may go well with you and that you may have a long life in the land. Fathers, don't stir up anger in your children, but bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Slaves, obey your human masters with fear and trembling, in the sincerity of your heart as to Christ. Don't work only while being watched in order to please men, but as slaves of Christ, do God's will from your heart. Serve with a good attitude as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatever good each one does, slave or free, he will receive this back from the Lord. And masters, treat your slaves the same way, without threatening them, because you know that both their master and yours is in heaven, and there is no favoritism with him. Thank you, Amanda, for reading that. Um, it's great to be here opening God's Word with you. Please keep it open, uh, either on your phone accessibly or in the Bible uh, in front of you. And let's pray as we prepare to consider it together. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would give us ears to hear your Word, uh, the hearts to receive it, and the wills to put it into practice. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, I wonder what you think of when you hear the word obey. Maybe your mind goes to specific things where obedience is fitting. You know, a dog obeying its owners. Or, you know, just all of us obeying the laws of the land. Or maybe your mind goes to the armed forces. You know, somewhere where necessarily requires people to follow orders, to obey orders. I think we, we tend to find obedience in these sorts of contexts uncontroversial, uncontroversial. But outside of these specific contexts, I think we are generally suspicious of the call to obey, especially here in our individualistic Western culture. We tend to hear it as a call to unthinking compliance. Unthinking compliance. We tend to associate it with things like authoritarianism and maybe even abuse of power. And that's because that has been our experience as well. Which is why these words can be hard to hear. Children, obey your parents. Slaves, obey your masters. As Mike said, we're in the second last week of our teaching series in Ephesians. And... Maybe you hear those words or you read them and you think, this just confirms all of my suspicions. Christianity is about unthinking compliance to authoritarian rule. It's spiritual dictatorship from the youngest of ages up. Or maybe you are less hostile to that picture that Amanda read out there that Paul describes of obedience, but you're still uneasy about it. It just doesn't seem to fit. With our, with our time and place, our cultural moment. And it's definitely true that there are significant differences between the world in which Paul wrote and our world now. But the fact is, and Paul makes this clear, and he's right to do so, the fact is, in our family lives and elsewhere, we are all either under someone's authority in one way or another, or we are exercising authority over someone in one way or another. And what matters in those relationships is not so much the position we hold, but the posture that we have. It's not the position, but the posture. And so, yes, this passage concerns obedience in certain relationships. Yes, this passage actively calls for obedience in certain relationships, but that is not what this passage is primarily about. Its ultimate call is not to obedience, but to a more fundamentally godly posture, a posture of humility. Humility is the secret source of Christian relationships. It's the key to unlocking well-functioning families and well-functioning communities. And that's what we see here in the beginning part of Ephesians chapter 6. We see, first of all, 
that we need to have humility in our family relationships. And it begins with the youngest in the family. It begins with the children. And Paul writes in verse 1, he says, Children, obey your parents as you would the Lord, because this is right. The parents have inherent authority as part of God's creation, as part of his good design for family functioning. This is a natural law that is observed one way or another by cultures across the world, Christian and not. And so that's partly why Paul says that child obedience is right. It's natural in that sense. But nature isn't the only reason it's right for children to obey their parents. Disobedience is what? As you would the Lord. Paul is addressing children of a church community. He's addressing children of a Christian family where Jesus is Lord. So ultimately, a child should obey their parents as part of loving obedience to Jesus himself. And this is incredible that, that a child could be addressed in the same breath as their parents, as husbands and wives. This is incredible that a child can, even in the most mundane carrying out of things that they've been asked to do, serve Jesus, washing up, tidying their room. And this Jesus-shaped obedience, it's actually part of a wider attitude and that's an attitude that's reflected in a, in a specific command from God, a command which leads to blessing. So verse 2, Honour your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may go well with you and that you may have a long life in the land. So Paul here is quoting one of the Ten Commandments. He calls it here the first commandment. And I think this likely means that this is a commandment of of first importance. And so it might be better understood as this for children is a primary commandment accompanied with a promise. And that original promise, when this command was originally given, it referred to a particular land, the promised land, Israel, Palestine. But Christians are a new humanity. We saw that in chapter 2, whose blessings are largely spiritual in Jesus. We saw that in chapter 1. And so the reference to in the land necessarily has to be more general than that. And this is reflected in lots of other translations, which translate in the land here in, in verse 3 as upon the earth. You can see that's more general. And so I think what is being promised here isn't necessarily long life to each child who obeys their parents, but general social stability in any community where children honour their father and their mother. And I think we know that from, we see the fruit of that, even in this imperfect world where even Christian relationships are messy and broken, Christians who honour their parents, they do tend to know the joys of a close family relationship and life and the trust and the joy that can flow from that, as a general rule. And so it's pretty clear for pre-adult children, kids living under their parents, you know, in their parents' house, are to obey their parents humbly. But also, there are hints here that a bit like wives' submission to their husbands, this child obedience is finite. That is, it has limits. So even children... Even children can draw a line of commands that are immoral, that ask them to do wrong things morally, or that are deliberately anti-godly. If a parent says, you're not allowed to be a professing Christian, you're not allowed to pray, a child does not have to obey that, because that's not obedience as to the Lord. And children should absolutely cease to obey any parental rule, or any parental rule given in the context of abuse. Absolutely they should. That, nothing about that situation is as to the Lord, is in the Lord. Now, it's difficult for children to do this. Pre-adult children, they are vulnerable. They aren't often able to speak up for themselves in this way. And that's why genuine child, Christian child raising is a community effort. It's a community effort. It's why we as a church community take things like safe ministry very seriously. And the church family, when it is walking in the light, it will be able to guide and help children in their obedience. When that obedience is appropriate, when it's not, 
They'll be able to help and protect if needed. So the call for kids to obey has a bit more direct. I think for adult children, this call to obey is just naturally less direct. We're no longer under our parents' authority in the same way, which is why the broader principle is important, necessary to keep in mind. Honour your father and your mother. Honouring our father and mother is much broader than that, and we do that as long as they're alive. And so that looks like respecting our parents, their, their wisdom, going to them for advice, and then not, not just turning that advice away, but actually listening to it, even as grown adults. And it means caring for them, maybe by visiting them, maybe by providing practical care, financial care. It might even mean accommodating them as they get older, as they get more frail. And so humility in family relationships, it begins with obedient children, children humbly obeying their parents. And it's completed by considerate parents. So Paul goes on in verse 4. He says, Fathers, don't stir up anger in your children, but bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. I think it's very likely that Paul singles out fathers here because as we've been reminded, fathers are the head of the family in, in, the, in the human family unit. And so they're the ones with the, with the responsibility well, that falls at their feet. But the word father was often used to refer both to mums and dads, a bit like how brothers was used to refer to brothers and sisters. And certainly in, in the context, verses 1 and 2, it refers to both parents. So absolutely, mums, I think you can hear this advice as well. I think it applies to you. And when Paul says, don't stir up anger in your children, what he isn't saying is, don't ever let your children be angry with you. That's bad parenting. You can't ever let your children be angry with you. Of course your children are going to be angry with you, and of course you are going to be in the right lots of those times. No, no, he says don't stir up anger, or don't provoke anger, or another translation is don't exasperate your children. When do we stir up anger in our children and exasperate them? We do that, we do that as a result of unnecessarily heavy-handed parental rule, I think. You know, when we discipline our kids, and our discipline is always inflexible, and we never explain it. There's no room for movement. There is obviously a place for discipline. But that discipline should never be, it shouldn't be arbitrary. You know, kids have an inbuilt sense of justice. If it's not explained, they're like, I don't understand what's going on. And it should never be unkind, because kids are inherently sensitive. And What's striking about this is we hear that and we go, well, of course. That's the water in which we swim, partly as an influence of this teaching over many, many generations. But in the Greco-Roman world, this is a complete contrast. It was an authoritarian society. Fathers ruled the roost. They could do what they liked with their children to the point where they could even sell them into slavery or put them to death, if they, if they so pleased. And so to hear this, being given, this is how you're supposed to parent your children, with this consideration, putting their needs before your own, utterly countercultural, utterly radical. But what, what does that look like? Uh, well, I was really helped last week. Paul, just Paul Hallam, our own Paul Hallam, shared on the Matt community, if you're on Facebook, the Matt community group, he shared an article um, from Anglican Youth Works. Oh, suddenly this is not quick and thought. There we go. Um, and it was an article about helping your child accept the rules by explaining the reasons behind them. And if you really want to be a godly, considerate parent, I cannot recommend this article highly enough. It's just very helpful in the practical advice that it gives. And uh, one of the things that the author says in it is, because I said so, that's why, may get the desired result of training your child into obedience and keeping them safe, but much more than that is possible. And who can afford to miss any opportunities to talk about how we, as followers of Jesus, live out our Christian values in the world. Do you see what she's saying here? First of all, she's saying, in explaining the rules, the reasons behind your rules, what we do is we equip our children with tools for future decision-making. So that's one thing she's saying. But she's also saying what Paul is saying. She's saying it's not just negative. It's not just don't parent that way. It's also positive. It's do parent this way, 
What way? In the training and instruction of the Lord. What does it look like to parent your children, to bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord? I think it means first and foremost, living out your faith with integrity, as in walking the talk. Because kids can can see that you're being hypocritical and that's going to do great damage to their growing faith. But it also means actively making time to provide your children with training and instruction of the Lord. So obviously church, wonderful place for that, to learn with peers. But church can also be, it has this one problematic element. Because bringing your children up in the training and instruction of the Lord is not something you can just leave to the paid church staff or to the trained kids' church leaders. There was no category for that in the early church. There were no paid staff in the same way. Specific children's ministry. There was no Matt Shannon in the early church. Responsibility is ultimately the parents. If you are a parent, you open the Bible with them. You pray with them. You model being actively involved in church as much as possible. This is considerate parenting, and it can't be outsourced, and it can't be done remotely, and it takes humility, because it may mean having to sacrifice your own relaxation time, your own me time, or maybe your own ambitions even, to make time to do this. Because that's humility in family relationships, beginning with, with obedient children, obeying as to the Lord, and being completed by considerate parents. And then Paul moves beyond the nuclear family. And we read about dutiful workers in verse 5. Paul says, Slaves, obey your human masters with fear and trembling, in the sincerity of your heart as to Christ. Now, if you are anything like me, maybe as Amanda read it or maybe just now as it's up there again, this verse at first glance isn't only foreign, but it's just a bit disturbing. I mean, slavery appears to be just taken for granted. And that's because it was. In the ancient world, slavery was almost universal. A high percentage of the ancient world population were slaves. It's estimated that throughout the Roman Empire, at any given time, there were 60 million slaves. They made up the workforce. But interestingly, they included not only domestic servants and manual labourers, the sort of people we would perhaps tend to think of, they also were made up of educated people in society, teachers, doctors, administrators. And one of the more common practices of the ancient world was for people to place themselves into a slave-master relationship, an arrangement for a period of time, often to pay off a debt or some other obligation. So we do need to recognise that the line between slave and servant worker is much finer than we perhaps think, to the point where the same word was used for both, depending on the context. So that's a bit of context about who Paul is addressing when he talks to the slaves. But we also, I think, need a bit of perspective. We need to be careful about our own modern moral superiority. You know, even after slavery was universally condemned and outlawed in the 19th century, unofficial forms of slavery continued, indentured servitude, child labour, These are the sorts of things that led in part to the formation of labour unions, to be able to collectively elevate workers above what was, in all but name, paid slavery. And even us, sitting here today, in our post-slave trade, UN Charter of Human Rights, 21st century, slavery continues to be a human reality. It just looks different. I mean, perhaps most horrendously, it's in the form of human trafficking, sex trafficking of adults and children. But perhaps most widely, it's economic slavery. You know, an almost inevitable byproduct of our wealth-producing capitalist system. 
Now, does all this make the Greco-Roman form of slavery that we read about here in Ephesians 6, does it make it right? I don't think so. Yes, it was distinct from the utterly dehumanizing uh, slave trading of the British Empire and, and the Americas. But the very idea of people as possessions rather than free people remains fundamentally wrong for those made in the image of God. And Greco-Roman slavery was still inherently dehumanizing. They didn't have rights. And so they were liable to be mistreated, and many of them were. So what is remarkable about what we read here, and it is remarkable, is that slaves are addressed at all. That slaves are addressed at all. Because it indicates that they were part of the church community. Equal in status with fellow church members. Equal in status with fellow church members who were nobles. Nowhere else in society would that happen. And Paul addresses them as utter equals. Why? Because before they are master and slave, they are brother and sister in Christ. And Paul certainly recognises the that slavery is not good. Elsewhere in his letters, when he addresses slaves, he encourages them that they can gain their freedom. They absolutely should do that. And so in Paul's words here, we have what's called a a recovery ethic. An ethic that seeks to recover from a broken and imperfect situation, a way to live. A way to live that is godly. And so what this is about, what Paul's on about here is applying realistic principles to a particular cultural situation so that you can work in a way that honours God. And I think at that point we realise and we learn how this extends beyond the slaves of the first century to us who find ourselves under the authority of others in working situations. And I think there are two key realistic principles. First, it's obeying with fear and trembling. And the other is working with sincerity of heart, working wholeheartedly. The term fear and trembling, it mostly meant with reverence. It's actually come up a few times throughout Ephesians. Basically, it just means having proper respect. And so obeying, I think obeying with respect, I mean, we can pay lip service to it, but in our hearts, that's much harder to do. When you maybe don't like your job that much, or you don't like your boss that much, how do you obey with proper respect? I think that leads us to the second one, which is to to work wholeheartedly. That is, not just to work when the boss is looking at you, to pay lip service to it, but genuinely to give your all as much as is appropriate to that. Because God sees everything. You're working for his glory. And when you work well at work, it brings honour to God when you work in Jesus' name. And it's to this extent that we can understand and apply what Paul says to slaves to ourselves. So whether as a slave in the ancient world or as an employee in the modern world, it takes humility to work under the authority of someone and to do it respectfully and to do it wholeheartedly. And so that's humility in working relationships. It starts with being dutiful workers, and it is completed by compassionate bosses. You know, the dehumanization of slaves, it was reflected in the Roman law. The law only regarded them as items of property. They had no rights. They could be treated as they liked, not unlike fathers could do with their children. And yet Paul goes on to issue this culturally shocking instruction to Christian masters in verse 9. He says, And masters, treat your slaves the same way without threatening them, because you know that both their master and yours is in heaven, and there is no favoritism with him. Treat your slaves, those under your authority, as you would treat yourself. Again, that just wouldn't make sense to 99% of the ancient world at the time. They think you're crazy for saying that. But this is the mutuality of believers. This is the utter equality of, of person and status that each has in the new humanity that is the family of God. Like I said earlier, 
in the Christian family, masters and slaves, or before they're masters and slaves, they're brothers and sisters in Christ. And so I think it's, it's reasonable to say that this principle, treating those under your authority as you would treat yourself, I think it extends to anyone, any Christian in authority in the workplace today. Yes, workers today have rights that the slaves didn't, but you know, in the, in the cut and thrust of the job market with all sorts of economic pressures, many workers feel more or less at the mercy of their employers, of their managers, of their supervisors. So Christian bosses have a unique opportunity, a unique opportunity to exercise authority in a way that is humble, in a way that is compassionate, in a way that points people to Jesus. It's the way of the God who does not show favoritism. The God who extends the same grace to the CEO and to the street sweeper, to the senior surgeon and the trainee registrar, to the master builder and the first year apprentice. And I know there are people in this church, in this room, who hold positions of authority at work, have people working under them. The people who work under you, at least from a work standpoint, have little choice but to obey you, as it were. So how do you exercise your authority in that position? Coldly, indifferently, critically, impatiently, or warmly, personally, encouragingly, patiently? If your authority is over a fellow believer, what do you need to remember? Remember that they're your sister or brother in Christ first and have the humility to submit to their best interests. If your authority is over a non-Christian, remember that you are a child of the God who doesn't show favoritism. So don't treat them any differently as you'd want to be treated. And as we get to the end of verse 9, we kind of see the point that that Paul's making crystallize. That whether the position you hold places you in authority or under authority, your posture should always be one of humility. Whether your position places you in authority or under authority, your posture should always be one of humility. And that's why it's humility in all relationships. Remember the context for all of this. Mike drew our attention to it last week. The last verse of chapter 5, chapter 5, verse 21. Submit to one another in the fear of Christ. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. That is the guiding principle for all of these relational instructions. It's out of reverence for Christ. And off the back of that, and with the constant refrain that seems to come up here about as to the Lord, you know, this reminds us that, that these aren't things to be done in a vacuum. We haven't been left without example. And we haven't been left without help. We have Jesus. Jesus who is the model of humility and the means of our humility. In Paul's letter to the Philippian church, in chapter 2, he's also talking about relationships. And what he says to the Philippians there, he could just as easily be saying to the wives and husbands, children and parents, slaves and masters of the Ephesian church. He says, In humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interest of the others. In your relationships with one, with one another, have the same mindset as Christ. Christ the model who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. He didn't hold on to his authority at all costs. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant or a slave. Being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself, becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Christ's humility is the model that governs all our relationships. If you're struggling for motivation to be humble in your relationships with your parents, with your kids, with those you work with under and over authority, look to Jesus. Look to the cross. 
So he's the model of humility. And Jesus is also the means of our humility. If you can remember all the way back in chapter 1, verse 3, we have been blessed in Christ with every spiritual blessing. We have God's Holy Spirit in us if our faith is in Jesus. And remember all of this relational advice, it's off the back of being filled with the Spirit. These are all pictures of Spirit-filled living. And because the Christian remains someone inclined to sin and disobedience, who's constantly having to put off the old self, the Holy Spirit continues to help us to see what God's way is and to want to live it in our relationships as in every other part of our life. They're the two pictures that Paul paints for us. Humility in our family relationships. Humility in our working relationships. And so whether your position places you in authority or under authority, your posture should be one of humility always. Humility with our kids. Humility with our parents. Humility with one another in every way. Amen. Thank you, Chris. <clears throat> Friends, in a moment, we're going to share together in the Lord's Supper in response to what we've heard from God's Word. Uh, but before we do that, I want you to take a moment now, just in the quiet of your own heart and mind, reflect on what you've heard uh, from God's Word today. Is there something uh, that you need to do in response to God's Word? Is there a change in thinking that needs to happen for you? Uh, is there someone that you need to talk to? Uh, why don't you just take a moment now? Uh, maybe close your eyes, reflect on what you've heard, and then we'll transition into the Lord's Supper together. Friends, the Lord's Supper is an outward and visible sign of the grace that has been shown to us all in Christ Jesus, our Lord. We're going to share together in a small piece of bread, and it's just ordinary bread, but this bread points to something extraordinary, to the bread of life, to the perfect life that Jesus lived in his body that he was prepared to sacrifice so that we might live. The small cup of juice that we're going to drink together is just ordinary juice, but again points to something extraordinary, to the blood of Christ, to his death on the cross. Whereas his blood was shed, our sins are washed away, completely forgiven, and we are reconciled to our heavenly Father. As we eat the bread and drink the cup together, we're invited to feed on Christ in our hearts by faith, with thanksgiving. We are faced again with God's love for the unworthy and we are strengthened by faith in the one whose body was given and whose blood was shed. And so if you have put your trust in Jesus, if you believe that he died and rose again for you, then this symbolic meal is for you to strengthen you and to comfort you uh, this day. But if in good conscience, given what this meal points to, uh, maybe it's not the right time for you to share in this meal. And, and that's okay. Don't feel compelled to share in this meal because that's what everybody else is doing. If you haven't yet put your trust in Christ, then just sit back and reflect again on what you've heard from God's word uh, today. But knowing the goodness of God and the times that even those of us who have been long-term followers of his son, and knowing that we still fall short of his glory and grace, let's humble ourselves this morning. A prayer will come up on the screen. Uh, will you say this prayer out loud with me? It's a prayer of confession. It's not meant to overwhelm us with a shame and guilt again, but to remind us to bring those things to the Lord who always forgives. Let's pray together. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we admit that we need your help. We have sinned against you in thought, word and deed and in what we have failed to do. Only you can save us. Have mercy on us. Wipe out our sins and teach us to forgive others. 
Strengthen us to serve you and live our lives to your glory. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Friends, remember that God is slow to anger and full of compassion. He always forgives those who humble themselves and turn to his son, Jesus, because in him there is no condemnation. Let's pray. We thank you, our Heavenly Father, that in your love and mercy, you gave your only Son, Jesus, to die on the cross for us. And by this offering of himself once and for all time, Jesus made a full, perfect and sufficient sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. And he commanded us to continue a remembrance of his precious death until his coming again. So hear us, merciful Father, and grant that we who receive these gifts of your creation, this bread and this cup, according to our Saviour's command, in remembrance of his suffering and death, may continue to share in the benefits of his body and his blood. Amen. On the night before he died, Jesus took bread, and after giving his heavenly Father thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to each of his disciples, saying, Take and eat all of you. This is my body, which is broken for you. Eat this in remembrance of me. And then after the meal, he took the cup. And again, giving his heavenly father thanks, he gave it to each of his disciples saying, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is being poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Drink this in remembrance of me. And so friends, that's what we're about to do eat and drink in remembrance of our Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to invite our communion helpers to come forward. I'm going to invite our music team to come down as well. Uh, As our communion helpers come to you in your seats this morning, just hold on to the small piece of bread or the gluten-free cracker. Hold on to the small cup uh, of juice. We're going to stand and we're going to sing together, O great God. And God is indeed great and good, merciful, kind in so many ways. And as we share in this time together, it's great to reflect again uh, on his character. So brothers and sisters, please stand. Let's sing together uh, as the bread and the juice come around. Supreme. 
Friends, please take a seat as our music team join us in this special time and just reflect again on what Jesus has done for us. In Philippians chapter 2, we hear these words. And when he, Jesus, had come as a man in his external form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. For this reason, God highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus, every knee will bow, of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Jesus has lived. Jesus has died. Jesus has risen again and Jesus is coming again soon. So take and eat this in remembrance of him and be thankful. And sisters and brothers in Christ, drink this in remembrance that Jesus' blood was poured out for you and be thankful. Let us pray. Loving Father, through faith in your Son and his saving death, our sins are forgiven. We share in the life of his risen body. And so with thankfulness for all your mercies, we want to offer ourselves to you this morning. We want to offer our lives to be a living sacrifice through Jesus Christ our Lord. Send us out into the world in the power of your Holy Spirit, to live and to work to your praise and your glory. Amen. Let's stand and let's sing the praises of the Lion and the Lamb.
Please take a seat for one last time. The formal part of our service has almost come to an end, but don't feel that you need to rush home. Please stay and enjoy uh, some morning tea with us outside in the sun and continue those conversations that we began before uh, as the kids he- uh, head-, head out to Kids Church. Uh, can I say just a quick encouragement to our regular members? Thank you for your financial partnership. Your generosity makes a difference. Uh, you can give today online at our church website, or if you'd like to give in person, Uh, you can use the black box at the double doors uh, on the way out. And today, as we saw last week, the secret source to all human relationships, particularly those in the household of faith, whether between husbands and wives, whether between parents and children, whether between bosses and employees, the secret source is humility. Putting the needs of somebody else over and above your own. And our model for that is, of course, the Lord Jesus Christ. And our means of doing that in our relationships is Jesus Christ, as we keep turning our hearts and minds to him, asking his spirit to so fill us with humility that it will overflow in terms of our dynamic, our posture, our relationships uh, towards one another. I hope that you've heard that over the last couple of weeks. And as we come to the end of Ephesians uh, next week, We're going to consider the spiritual aspect of our identity, that we're not alone in this world, that there are evil forces at work, and and how do we stand firm uh, in the Lord Almighty? So look forward to that next week. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for our time together this morning. We thank you for the songs that we have sung. We thank you for the words that we have shared, and we thank you for your word that we have heard. And we pray that your spirit will now take that word and plant it deep in our hearts and minds, that we might live out our identity in Christ Jesus, the one who did humble himself, even to the point of death, even death on a cross, that we might live. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Let's go and enjoy some morning tea together.